Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Generations Bible Study of St. Stephen Church in Louisville, Kentucky. My name is Ken Jobst, and we're continuing our ongoing study of the Gospel of Mark. Today, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 52. I'm so pleased that we've got this time together to study the Word of God. Let's dive right in. We're going to take a look at Mark chapter 10. Let's look at the segment from verse 32 to verse 34 as we begin our study today. The scripture reads as follows. Now, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then Jesus took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Now let's pause right here. And as, as you notice, um, let me just say a couple of things here as we, we get underway. Um, what we have in these verses from verse 32 through verse 34, we have the third time Jesus is predicting his passion, suffering, death, and resurrection. This is the third time in three chapters. We saw it first in chapter 8. We saw it last time in chapter 9. And we see it here in chapter 10. So the setting is this. They are on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus has steadfastly um, you know, resolved to go to Jerusalem. And by the way, um, this is right after Jesus has taught the disciples ab about uh, how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle. Well, this has just like exploded the, uh, the minds of the disciples because their experience was always that it was the rich who had the leisure time to be able to study all of the intricacies of the Torah. Because if, if you had to work for a living, then you would not have the necessary time to delve deep into the Torah to the, the degree that the scribes and many of the Pharisees did. Um, that's one of the things I like about the Bible, right? I can, I can pick up the Word of God. It will take you a little while to read cover to cover, but I've got to tell you what, if you read at the same pace that I am speaking, just at a regular conversational pace, you'll be able to read cover to cover the entire Bible in 80 hours. Now, uh, look, 80 hours, you say, well, hey, that's a lot. But what I'm talking about is, <coughs> excuse me, the, the disciples were encountering these people who devoted their entire lives to studying the first five books of the Bible. Right? This much Bible, right here, versus the whole Bible. They were spending their entire lives, uh, you know, studying the Torah. And the idea was that that's how they would find eternal life. Now, <coughs> Excuse me, that, that has, uh, that's shocked the disciples. They, they can't even fathom that, well, who then can be saved is the question. And Jesus says, hey, look, what's impossible with man is, is possible with God. So they're, they're still kind of befuddled. Their minds are like uh, still struggling to grasp what Jesus is saying here. So they're on the road. They're going up to Jerusalem. Jesus goes before them. They're amazed right? They're just, wow, amazed, and they're afraid. The disciples are amazed and afraid. It's interesting to me that here there's no mention that the disciples are trusting or that the disciples are confident, which is an interesting word. To be confident means that you have, 
you are acting with faith. Confides. Confident. With faith. Doesn't say they're operating with faith. Doesn't say that they're they're trusting Jesus. It just says that they are amazed and they're afraid. Now, why are they afraid? Oh, they, they could be afraid of a lot of different things. Maybe they're afraid of being one of the last that's going to, one of the first that's going to be last, or one of the last that's going to be first. Maybe they're afraid that they thought the rules of the entire game have changed and they really have no clue about. You know, wow, this is a topsy-turvy um, thing that Jesus is, is teaching us. How are we going to come to apply this to our real lives? So they're amazed and afraid. Now, once again, as I mentioned earlier, this is the third time that Jesus predicts his suffering, death, and resurrection. In the Bible... The repetition of something three times is uh, an indication of its superlative importance. Uh, for example, in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up. The, the angels, the seraphim, cherubim are flying back and forth shouting, holy, holy, holy. Right. So that's the su superlative holiness exists in God. To repeat something three times is a superlative expression. And it's also a means by which it's, it's taken to be a certainty. If something is said once, okay, it's been said. If it's said twice, oh, now you've got my attention. If it's said three times, that generally would seal it as a, 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 an absolute certainty. So this is the third time Jesus has mentioned this in three chapters to his disciples. And, and I, I want you to pay particular attention because there's a pattern to how this works. There's a pattern in Jesus' description of his upcoming suffering, death, and resurrection. Watch. The pattern goes like this. Step one, Jesus predicts to his disciples his approaching death and or suffering, death, and resurrection. So he makes the prediction. Immediately following the prediction, one or more of the disciples makes a foolish statement. Foolish statement, right? Something that, that makes, you know, from, from the perspective of the kingdom of God, makes no sense whatsoever. So in chapter 8, right after Jesus describes his upcoming suffering, death, and resurrection, Peter says, you know, uh, far be this from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. So Peter rebukes Jesus, which was a foolish thing to do. Jesus comes back and says, you know, get thee behind me, Satan. In chapter 9, immediately after Jesus' second prediction of his death, in chapter 9, the disciples have this um, conversation about who's going to be the greatest, right? Who's the greatest? Now, in chapter 10, we're going to see in just a few verses that immediately following Jesus' statement predicting his upcoming suffering, death, and resurrection, well, now you've got James and John, and they're foolishly worrying about who's going to be seated to the left and the right of Jesus when he comes into his glory. So, Jesus makes a prediction of his suffering, death, and resurrection. One or more of the disciples makes a foolish statement following their hearing that prediction. And then that is followed by a significant teaching by Jesus about servanthood or around the general topic of servanthood. So if, if, you know, at your leisure, go back and take a look in chapter 8, chapter 9, and here in chapter 10, that's the pattern. The prediction, the foolish response of the disciples, and then Jesus' deeper teaching on servanthood. Well, let's, let's continue now in verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Teacher, 
we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Now, let me give just a little bit of, of background about the question. So the disciples, James and John, sons of Zebedee, come to Jesus and they say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> now watch, watch. What kind of lame brain question is that? Right? Uh, who, who in their right mind would, would give uh, an, an affirming response to a question like that? Um, you know, we, we want you to do whatever we ask. I, I can hear fourth graders asking that of, of their, you know, parents or something. Uh, Mom, Dad, let me do whatever, you know, grant whatever I ask you. Well, you got to understand just a, a little bit about this particular question. It's a formulaic question, and it, it actually carries some hidden meaning uh, that was more obvious in first, second, first century Palestine. It was a little more obvious to see what was going on. James and John, sons of Zebedee, come to Jesus and they say, here's the quote, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, There's more going on there. There's more going on in that question. That question is phrased in the pattern of a common formula for asking a favor of a king. So it's, it's, it's the, uh, the, the stylized way of asking a favor for a king. So, so the, you know, the petitioner would come into the palace or the throne room. They would be granted admission. And the, the thing was, the petitioner would ask, King, grant me whatever I ask of you. Now, while that sounds reckless to us, in that day and time, the question, the, 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 the petition, the, the ask that would come following that would be very precisely stated. Uh, and it would not be something like wild and crazy. It would be something that would be uh, typically a request that would be flattering to the king. You, you got to understand, you know what, um, back in the day, back in Jesus' day, in the day of the disciples, there was what was known as a patronage system. And the, the patronage system kind of worked like this. There, there would be a, a, a rich person, a well-to-do person. And, well, they might be the king or they might be somebody who had no governmental, no official governmental post, but they would be a significant landowner, for example, or, or someone who was of a particular, you know, upper, higher social class. They would be the patron. And the patron would, through a variety of perhaps unspoken social contracts, would extend favors to various people in the community. Now, everybody always kept track of the favors, and, and, and the, you, you were considered to be magnanimous as a, a rich person if you would act as a good patron to the community around you. So that was seen as one of the responsibilities of having wealth was that you acted as a good patron. Those who would approach the patron would approach the patron in such a way as to, uh, you know, butter them up a little bit. And in buttering them up, they would say things like, grant us whatever we would wish. And the understanding there was that Whatever this patron had, they, they had enough of it to grant the wishes of whoever would show up on their doorstep. So there, there's a little, understand this, there's a little psychology going on here. And the psychology is to build up the patron, but then you give the question 
that is something that is typically well within the patron's ability to deliver. By the way, if you would like a really, really good uh, kind of contemporary illustration of this, take a look at the very first 10 minutes of the movie The Godfather, the, the original Godfather with Marlon Brando. And in the first 10 minutes, you see a case of uh, Marlon Brando, who is playing the Godfather, Don Corleone. And it's the, the, the wedding day of Don Corleone's daughter. And so that's considered to be an auspicious day to approach the patron with a request. And on that day, the, the, first, the, the first scene in the movie The Godfather uh, concerns someone who is approaching their patron, Don Corleone, with a request. And it's loosely, you know, you can, you can see the movie and it, it loosely follows this pattern that the, uh, the, the person approaches the patron and says, grant me this request, Godfather. And so the, the expectation is that, okay, it'll be obviously a request that the Godfather can, can or the patron, right, can supply. Anyway, if you just want to see a, a film version of something going on like this, the, the Godfather gives really a, a very clear idea of what it was like to approach a patron for a favor. Now, I've said all of this to say that that's what's going on with James and John. They're approaching Jesus, and they're using king language with Jesus. You know, grant us whatever we, we desire. They're using that uh, flattery-type approach to come to Jesus to make a request of him. And Jesus says, once again, playing along, kind of, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Which would have been a perfectly appropriate thing for a patron to say. What would you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. So it, it sounds like James and John wanted to be the vice president or the secretary of state or the prime minister or, you know what, Jesus, when you come into your power, because we know it's going to happen, we just want you to grant this one request. You, you're going to have to have cabinet members. You need a prime minister. You need somebody to help run things. Have us, you know, the, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, we want to be your number one and number two, or number one and 1.5. You know, we, we want to be there with you when you come into your glory. Okay, from a patronage point of view, that, that was a request that was, you know, okay, you know, yeah, that, that's how it was done before you get elected, right? If, you know what? If, if you want a, uh, a cabinet-level job, you better make your wishes known before the election, right? But better get out there, better get visible. Well, here's James and John. They're making this ask of Jesus. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. Well, once again, Jesus could have said right now, right now, Jesus could have said, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. Right? That would have been perfectly appropriate for Jesus to say to James and John right now right then. There, there's a cup to be drunk from, right? There's, there's a baptism to be baptized with. The cup to be drunk from is, you know, typically that's considered to be the, the cup of God's wrath, right? That, that needs to be, uh, need, need to drink of the cup of God's wrath. And, and the, the baptism is, yipes, that's going to be an immersion into suffering, a baptism of suffering. Well, and Jesus says to them, they say, we are able. They're saying, like, sure, we can do this. They're, they're speaking out of ignorance. 
But Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. Wow. Okay, sounds great, doesn't it? Well, but, but for real, it's meaning that the disciples are going to undergo a, a similar experience that Jesus goes through. And that experience is going to include, for all of the disciples except one, uh, is going to include martyrdom, death. I, I should say all the disciples except two. So we'll, we'll, take, we'll take Judas out. Judas kills himself, right? So he's, he's out of the running. But the remaining disciples, only John lives to be an old man, right? And he's exiled. So he drinks the cup. He undergoes the baptism. But Jesus continues in verse 40, But to sit on my right hand and my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. So here goes, right? Uh, Jesus is saying, look, James, look, John, that ain't my decision. That's a decision that's going to be made at the time. And the people that are put in those positions, you're not going to want to be one of those people. Because when did Jesus come into his glory? James and John are thinking of like the coronation of Jesus. The, the day they put the crown on Jesus. Oh yeah, we want to be there and, and sit next to him on his left and on his right. But Jesus, understanding what's going to happen to him, recognizes that he is going to come into his glory on the cross and to be on the left and on the right of Jesus while Jesus is on the cross. Well, that's going to be the position of the two thieves, the penitent thief and the impenitent thief. Those, those are not positions that are going to be available to James and John. What were James and John asking for? Actually, in their ignorance, they were asking to be crucified with Jesus. And Jesus said, well, look, that, that's not going to happen at the same time. But you'll undergo a baptism of suffering. And you will drink of the cup from which I drink. You know what? I, I want to come back, and I'm going to come back to this a couple of times. I want to come back to verse 36. Jesus is asking the question of James and John. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Now, that's a very important question. And you know what? It, not only is it an important question, it's a contemporary question. Because that's a question that Jesus is going to ask each and every one of us. What, what do you want me to do for you? Hmm. What do you want Jesus to do for you? Think about that a little bit and recognize that Jesus leaves us this question in the context of some disciples who foolishly made a, a demand of Jesus. Now, but okay, by the way, it's an important question, it's a contemporary question, and we're going to find out it's a repeated question. This question gets repeated verbatim in verse 51. Now, let's continue in verse 41. Continuing in verse 41. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. <laughs> right? I wonder if that was just envy right? That, that they were displeased with James and John simply because they didn't think of it themselves, simply because they had been, uh, you know, out, outdone. Somebody was quicker on the draw than they were in making that request. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. That is, that they, they lord over them their authority which means they, they pull rank, right? 
and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So right here, Jesus lays out uh, an important principle of leadership in the kingdom of God. He says, look, the, the Gentile rulers, they use authority as a club, you know, to, to beat you over the head with. They, they lord it over you. But kingdom rulers, Jesus says, kingdom rulers, the rulers within the kingdom of God are servant leaders. And so hereby, Jesus once again defines greatness by service. The measure of greatness in the kingdom of God is service. Which leads us to verse 45, which I that I believe verse 45 is the key to understanding the entirety of the gospel of Mark. Verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, by the way, in, in the ancient Near East, the... Uh, the gods, small g gods, the pagan gods, the idols that were worshipped. Typically, the, the, uh, the framework for worshipping one of the small g gods was that you had to serve the god. And many times that was taken like quite literally, that you needed to go out and harvest food, uh, harvest grain or crops, and, and uh, maybe slaughter a calf or a... a a lamb or, or whatever, whatnot, to provide for the God, small g, God. So all of those gods came to be served, that humanity existed simply to serve the gods in that uh, very prescribed way. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Now, not only were the, the pagan gods or idols to be served, right? But actually the, the leaders under pagan systems, uh, the, the, the pagan priests and, you know, Pharaoh and, and whatnot, they were all to be served. As a matter of fact, wait, just, just right, right now, think of ancient Egypt, what symbol naturally comes to mind when you think of ancient Egypt? Well, for, for most of us, the symbol that comes to mind thinking of ancient Egypt is the pyramid, right? The pyramid, which demonstrates there's only room at the top for one. And everybody who is under that one their lot in life is to serve that one. Now, that's, you know, that, that's kind of the way a, a lot of exploitative and oppressive governments work. The idea is that everybody has to serve the one. So, um, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And, to give his life a ransom for many. To give his life. So once again, we're seeing that that's an echo of the three times repeated prediction that Jesus makes about his suffering, death, and resurrection. Well, the scene shifts, and we, go, we continue on to verse 46, and in the segment, verse 46 through 52, we see that the action happens in Jericho. Jesus has been traveling from the Galilee 
and he's traveled over into the Transjordan. He comes back over across the Jordan into Jericho and is going to be making his, his journey from Jericho up to Jerusalem. So he enters into Jericho. By the way, Jericho is, as you may know, uh, Jericho is a cursed city. Uh, it, all the way back in Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6 verse 26 reads like this. Then Joshua charged them at that time saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds the city of Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. So Joshua pronounced a curse upon Jericho. Remember, uh, Jericho was destroyed, right? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Not really, right? Joshua surrounded the city of Jericho seven times, shouted the walls came down. Now, Joshua pronounces this curse on Jericho. Many, 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 many years later, a new Joshua, except his, the Greek rendering of his name is Jesus. The Hebrew is Yeshua or Joshua. So here a new Joshua comes to the city of curse or the city that has been cursed and brings a blessing. Watch this. Now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho. What, what, and, and that's all it says. He came to Jericho and then on his way out. Doesn't say he did anything in Jericho. He came to Jericho. He's on his way out of Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, I just want to jump in here to say this is the only example in the Gospel of Mark where the crowd tells somebody to be quiet. Usually the crowd's making the noise, right? In this instance, the crowd warns Bartimaeus to be quiet. Verse 49, so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? Look, that, that's the repeat of the question that Jesus asked James and John. What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Well, there's, there, that's the story of Bartimaeus. Now, understand, Jesus is passing through, passing through Jericho, right? It's, it's a seven-hour uphill walk from Jericho to Jerusalem. So Jesus is not lingering in Jericho. He knows he's got a long walk ahead of him, and he knows that when he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be handed over to the authorities, and he's going to be killed. Bartimaeus in Jericho, the cursed city. Bartimaeus cries out, Jesus, son of David. Jesus, son of David. Bartimaeus is using a messianic title to address Jesus. That's another way of saying Bartimaeus is calling Jesus the Messiah. That's why the crowds were telling him, shh, be quiet. Don't be, don't be talking like that. When Bartimaeus cries out, he's calling Jesus the Savior. He's calling Jesus the Messiah. And watch this. Watch. 
very soon, very soon now, Jesus will enter into Jerusalem. And what will the crowds on Palm Sunday morning, what will the crowds be shouting as Jesus enters Jerusalem? They will be shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. The crowds in Jerusalem will soon identify Jesus just the same way Bartimaeus identified Jesus. Verse 49, verse 49 leaps out at me. So Jesus stood still. Jesus, look, Jesus was resolutely set his face toward Jerusalem. Jesus was on his way as to an appointment in Jerusalem. What could stand in his way? Nothing could stand in his way. However, Bartimaeus cried out, and he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stops and stands still. When someone calls him by name, they call him Messiah, and he has a plea for mercy. Mercy stops Jesus in his tracks. Jesus stood still. And Jesus asked Bartimaeus the very same question that he asked James and John, his own disciples. What do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus comes right out and says, look, that I may, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Jesus says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Immediately. Bartimaeus gains his sight, and with his new sight, he follows Jesus on the road. For Bartimaeus, Jesus' way became his way. He chose to follow Jesus. What did Bartimaeus want? Bartimaeus wanted to be able to see. You know what? If only the disciples, if only James and John would have had the same request of Jesus. Three times he's been talking about his approaching suffering, death, and resurrection. If only James and John, when Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? If only James and John would have said, Lord, that we might be able to see. That we might be able to see the way you see. Wow. Wow. Well, we're, we're almost done. Well, a couple, a couple of questions now. A couple of questions. First of all, uh, let's, consider, let's consider together this question of Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Now, that is the quintessential question of a servant. And remember, the Gospel of Mark depicts Jesus as the ideal servant the suffering servant of God. So it's a question that is a servant's question. You know what? And when we hear this, what do you want me to do for you? Does the question imply to us that Jesus will grant our every wish? That Jesus is like a genie in a bottle? You, 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 you know, you rub the lamp and the genie comes out and, you know, tell me what your wish is. Your wish is my command. Is that what Jesus is saying here? Like many passages of the Bible, I'm thinking Jesus' question here, uh, the answer reveals more about ourselves than anything else. When Jesus asks us, when Jesus asks me, what do you want me to do for you? That's going to reveal who I am. Do, do I want Jesus to, to shower me with jewels and money and whatever, whatnot? Or, like Bartimaeus, do I want to see more clearly his love, his mercy, and the kingdom of God? Now, you know what? Let's, let's go back to this key verse for the Gospel of Mark, from Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know what? This, is a, this, this verse essentially serves as Jesus' mission statement. 
This is what Jesus is all about. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let me ask the question. Jesus is referring to a ransom here. To whom was the ransom paid? Was the ransom paid? You know, we, we think of we think of ransoms, we, we typically think of kidnappers uh, who demand a ransom. Who's demanding the ransom here? Hmm. Any ideas? I'll tell you right off, the, the, the ransom is not demanded by Satan. Satan does not demand a ransom. The ransom, rather, is, is wrapped around the idea of the, the, the propitiation, the expiation of, of God's wrath, to, to set aside the wrath of God with respect to sin in the world. And then, just as a closing thought, Quite often when we quote scripture, we can inadvertently sometimes leave off important parts of verses. The entirety of verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So there's two components to that. Uh, this is a verse that pairs together service and sacrifice, service and sacrifice, that Christ calls us in many different ways to serve, as well as Christ calls us in many different ways to sacrifice. Well, that's some thoughts on, on Mark chapter 10. Next time, we're going to be taking a look at Mark chapter 11 as we continue this study. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to grow in our knowledge and love of you. Help us to seal in our hearts uh, those lessons which speak to us, Lord, of your love and your grace, your mercy. Help us, Heavenly Father, ever to, to grow closer to you, that we might know you more fully, serve you more completely, and love you with our whole heart. We thank you for the fellowship we enjoy. We give you all thanks and praise this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, once again, from Louisville, Kentucky and the St. Stephen Church, this is Ken Jobst with the Generations Bible Study. Until next time, take care. God bless you. We'll see you. Bye-bye.